Welcome to this wonderful talk on caregiving and supporting caregivers. Uh, we feel at Mission Hospice that this is a, an essential, essential subject to bring up because so much caregiver burnout is out there uh, when people are caring for loved ones. So since it's now 401, we're just going to start off with a short meditation and then I will introduce our panelists and we will jump right in. Uh, during this meditation, everybody is muted, so we won't hear anything. That will be fine, and we'll let a few more people come in at that point. So um, it's always good to do a quick meditation as Director of Volunteer Services. My name is Craig Schroeder, by the way, Director of Volunteer Services at Mission Hospice. I always invite my volunteers to do a quick meditation before they go in and start being the caregiver to a patient and for that family. It grounds them, it lets them let go of things and gets them ready for the task at hand. And even caregivers can do this as well. So I invite everybody just to put your feet firmly on the ground and feel the ground, your back straight. Close your eyes and just start feeling your breath slowly breathing in and out of your nose. Feel your heartbeat. Feel that lovely heartbeat pumping blood throughout your body. And also feel your feet on the ground. And take three deep breaths through your nose. Hold it for a second and exhale. And as uh, caregivers need to be, they need to be grounded. So imagine roots growing through your feet down into the black dirt, going down, down into the water table, roots spreading out into the rocks and the water table. Keep going down down to the center of the earth, the hot core of the earth. With each breath, pull that earth energy up to the bottom of your feet. And just feel that energy coming up through your calves, your knees, your quadriceps, and into your pelvic region. Just feel that earth energy sit there and start grounding you. Take a deep breath and bring it up into your torso and let it just wrap around your heart and let your heart open up and ground in this beautiful grounding energy. And open your heart up to yourself and to what is going to be the next hour. Keep breathing through your nose and bring that energy up into your shoulders and down your arms. Now up into your mind. Open your mind up to yourself and to this panel and let go of any distractions that might be there. They'll be there later on. Now just feel the grounding energy and breathe through your nose slowly and feel your heartbeat. And I invite you to take three deep breaths through your nose and exhale through your mouth and you can open your eyes and join the discussion.
Well, welcome everybody. It is good to see all these names that are in front of me. Uh, today's discussion is on caring for the caregiver and how the caregiver can care for themselves and how they can ask for things and how us being around caregivers can give to the caregiver so they feel appreciated and they can carry on with a very difficult job that they do have. Um, I am the facilitator again, Craig Schroeder, Director of Volunteer Services here at Mission Hospice. And our panelists, I will introduce them and then they can talk about who they are and what brought them to be who they are today and on this panel. Um, first, I'll introduce Jen Chan. Uh, Jen, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, from where you're tuning in from, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I am, uh, I guess in terms of caregiving, I'll just start off. I'm, I'm a former caregiver. I'm, right now I'm a former caregiver. I was a caregiver for 10 years for my grandma who had diabetes. And I was a young caregiver. I started in my mid twenties um, and that lasted for about 10 years. So I like to say that my caregiving um, experience really um, happened in my formative adulthood years. And then um, from there, I was inspired by all my caregiving. I decided to become an um, entrepreneur in where I create and design caregiving products that celebrate caregiverhood. So um, my passion from caregiving went, started with caregiving for my grandma. I started a business where I uh, create caregiver products. And then I also, because of caregiving, um, I decided to become a caregiver coach where now I facilitate caregiver support groups specifically for younger adults. And I'm here today because, uh, uh, I mean, because Mission Hospice invited me, obviously, <laughs> very, um, very honored to do that. But um, hospice care also holds a very, very special place in my heart. Um, the last three years, uh, the, the last three months of grandma, um, she had hospice cares at, at home and I live with grandma. So being by her, being by her side, being her primary caregiver, and experiencing caregiving and hospice at the same time, um, just really, really shed a light on the caregiving experience and how I believe caregivers should not do it alone. It not only takes a village, a team. I think it, it takes a lot of other people to let them know and give caregivers permission to do what they do, express themselves and seek help when they need to. So um, I'm happy to be here today to share my story on caregiving, my journey through the hospice years, and also, you know, what caregivers can do to take care of themselves. 10 years is a long time taking care of um, taking care of a grandma and, you know, it's by trial and error. So hopefully some of the tips and tricks here can um, help you uh, for those caregivers that are on the call today, whether you're a professional or a family caregiver, um, uh, any little bit of tip or tricks I think could really help um, along through the process. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thank you, Jen. And also Jen's website for her company and what she does was just posted in the chat. And I want to thank Elijah for being in the background, taking care of all the technical issues <laughs> and everything that do come up. And uh, before we go to Judy, I do want to say, um, there will be a question and answer period at the end. So we invite you to um, type in your questions into the chat and then we will get those at the end that Elijah will bring forward to us. Um, or you can just save your questions to the end and raise your hand and we'll take it from there. Uh, our other panelist is Judy Carlson. Uh, she, I'll just let her introduce herself. I don't need to do anything else, not do I. <laughs> Judy, go ahead. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, my name is Judy Carlson. And um, by profession, my background is I was a registered nurse. And most of my career, I worked um, on a trauma surgical unit at San Francisco General Hospital. Um, but on a personal note, um, one of the reasons I'm so interested in this topic and ways that we can possibly help caregivers is that I experienced personally uh, taking care of four family members over the years uh, who all were on hospice. And um, so I, you know, dealing with it on a very personal level was very different than doing it professionally or even as a, a volunteer, because as a volunteer, and I have been a volunteer with Mission Hospice since 2005, and feel that so much of what the volunteers do 
is this support of the caregivers and to be there to answer questions and to remind the caregivers that they have resources, that they have people who will back them up, who will support them. So from all those different vantage points, I just see this conference is, is such an opportunity uh, to discuss caregiving because so many people who become caregivers, they don't ask for it, it happens. And they make the big decision to take it on. So um, I'm hoping we can give you some good information through, through this hour. Thank you, Judy, and thank you, Jen. Um, that's really good. You know, caregiving is, is as, Judy so eloquently said, is all of a sudden it's just handed to them. They're just there. Somebody needs to take care of the loved one or a relative. Um, some people do it as a profession. More, normally do not get paid by their family members to do that. They're doing it out of the kindness of their heart and the relationship they do have. But uh, what everybody wants and part of human nature is to feel nurtured. Uh, this is especially true for the needs of caregivers who often are underappreciated for the hard work that they do, long hours, and the assumed expectations of the job that's at hand. Um, I do know this because I cared for my mother for 11 years, and it was all on me. Although I had siblings, uh, they just assumed it was all done on me and really just, you take care of mom, I have a life to live. So uh, there wasn't a lot of nurturing in that formula, and that's the way it is often with families. So um, Judy and Jen, please discuss your thoughts on how caregiving can nurture be, uh, can, caregivers can be nurtured in a way that best supports them. One of the things that I certainly think is acknowledging to the caregiver that it's understood that this isn't something that they particularly signed up for, but the fact that they would take it on is the most amazing thing because caregiving is different for every single patient. Um, you never know what's coming down the pike. And so it's a scary time for a lot of people. And the fact that they take that on is just so amazing. And I think making sure that they understand that and that's appreciated and that's recognized is, is key to just setting the tone for um, you know, our wishes to be supportive and to be helpful to them. And I'll jump in on that too, Judy. Absolutely. I think um, becoming a caregiver, just um, being recognized for the role itself, it's important because if we're doing this day in, day out, and that none of our family, friends, or community members are checking in, it can sometimes feel very isolated, very feel very alone. Um, and Craig, I, you know, to answer your question, when I was thinking about how, you know, how how can caregivers be nurtured, I I often think about comfort, um, our ability as caregivers to communicate what our comfort levels are, what our comfort needs are, and if we're able to communicate our comfort needs to um, say our family um, and friends, then they can nurture us the way we want to, you know, the way we feel like we can feel nurtured, you know, it's very simply, I, I, I'm a foodie, I like to eat. So I would say, you know, tell, tell my network what my comfort food is. You know, if I've been caregiving for very long days, maybe a couple of the folks can know, hey, this is your comfort food, let me get it delivered. Um, you know, there's a lot of you know, on-demand apps, delivery apps now, right? You know, wow, thanks for sending me my favorite ice cream. I feel nurtured, you know, my comfort food, you know, or knowing that maybe if food's not your thing, maybe it's music, maybe knowing what type of music is good for you, not only you, but maybe even your car, um, care, uh, care recipient, then that could be a comfort, uh, comfort, uh, comfort experience for both you and your care partner. So I think in caregiving, when we're able to kind of, you know, uh, when we're not too busy taking care of caregiving, but realizing that some of our comfort levels could be met, I think when we can explain it to our community, hopefully they can hear that and say, you know what, let's send some comfort to caregiver Judy, or let's send some comfort to caregiver Craig, because I know this is what he or she or they they like, because those it's been a long time when we haven't heard from them. Well said. Both of you well said. Um, many caregivers are spouses, a child, a grandchild, niece, nephew, 
or a friend of the patient, when the caregiver role is taken on, the loving family role is often suppressed by the change and the stress that it brings. Caregivers miss the role that they used to have with the patient and family, as well as the patient and family missing the relationship they shared with that loved one. This caregiving all of a sudden changes things around. You trade being a husband or wife for being a caregiver and the primary relationship often becomes a caregiver rather than husband, wife, child, friend, so on and so forth. It is okay for the caregiver to express how they missed their relationship as it was because of their new role now. Um, Judy and Jen, just, can we talk about how uh, can a caregiver express how they missed that relationship that they had in a positive loving light and how can they work together to bring part of that relationship back to the stress of caregiving? I certainly think that first and foremost, it's important to, to let the caregiver know that it's fine to say to their loved one, their husband, their wife, whoever, I really miss our normal relationship. You know, this has changed for us. This is different for us because certainly the patient is feeling that same loss just as well. It's all about doing. What do I need to do for you versus just being? And that in itself, I think, sort of sets the tone for giving the caregiver having permission that it really is okay to sit down, take a deep breath, grab someone's hand and just be together and to let that person know what the intent is. I think it's, it's so therapeutic for both, both the caregiver and the, the patient. And I think it's well to take, uh, to let that be said to the families too. Um, I know my situation was unique because I was a nurse. And so it was the normal thing. Well, you're the nurse and that was fine, but I also had my personal needs for the person in my family who was going through the dying process. And I had to make it very clear, you know, I, I want some time just with them. Um, for me, my experience um, really came with a role reversal um, and taking on my identity for mm -hmm. taking care of my grandma, right? I'm the granddaughter, she's my grandma. And I also want to throw in my brother was also a part of um, taking care of my grandma too. So we were both primary caregivers living in the same house with grandma. And both of us, um, and taking on caregiving, we just thought we, you know, we just taken care of our parent. Now grandma raised us. We thought this was just something we're supposed to do. This is our duty. We didn't even know what caregiver, the caregiver identity was. So when, when thinking about taking, you know, the role of be, you know, the family relation, the, the grandson, granddaughter, and grandma relationship, and then the caregiver relationship. It was, um, it was a really, it was an interesting ride just because it was, it didn't, I think I personally didn't even identify as a caregiver until year five of 10 years. Cause I thought I was just being a granddaughter. So in taking on caregiving and trying to figure out how I can step away from a caregiver role and be a granddaughter. It was very blended for a while until I realized, wow, I'm not just doing something for my loved one. Caregiving is an actual job. Sometimes it feels like a, another full-time job. So I learned, you know what? Just like work, I need to clock out. I need to have office hours where I say, you know what? No caregiving. I need to revitalize this relationship with, um, you know, with my grandma. And, you know, not only was it with my grandma, I felt like there were times I missed my brother, my sibling, because it was, we were just sharing tasks. Like, okay, you get this weekend, I get this weekend, you do these, I do this. But then it became such a working relationship with my brother and I that I thought, you know, let's carve out some just sibling time where we're not caregiving. Let's, let's continue to make sure that our relationship is thriving. And then also have a relationship with grandma and figure out what we can do and create new memories. And I feel like when it comes to caregiving, there's, there's this intersectionality of identities, right? We're not just, we're not just a daughter or a granddaughter or a mother or a spouse in terms of caregiving, that's one identity. Then there's also um, you know, the caregiver role if we choose to accept that. 
been another identity could just be our profession you know Judy was a nurse you know or maybe uh, another character could be a musician maybe uh, you're a teacher so you add on that those other identities and when you have all those identities with caregiving it's it's possible to forget to feed into those right because it's something that could, you could be very passionate about about yourself caregiving can take away time lots of time <laughs> And it's important to give time to those other things that you feel so connected to because that's part of your whole being. And I, th I think that's one of the things that's possible in talking about caregiving and by saying, hey, you know, what? I'm gonna take a break from caregiving. I'm gonna focus on doing something that's good for my career. Maybe not a lot, but maybe a little at a time, little increments. And then also, okay, now I'm gonna focus on creating new memories with um, my grandma. Maybe I can't do the same activities as I did did, could three, four years ago with my grandma, now she's bedridden, but what new activities, what new memories can I create um, with my grandma so that I can have that new connection? And what can I do with my brother when it's not me and him going to the store to pick up supplies? How can I create a new relationship with him so that we both can be present um, as caregivers and as also as grandchildren for our grandma while we were caregiving by her side? I mean, it's no easy formula. Let's just throw it out there. You got to you got to figure it out. You don't figure it out right. overnight, but you kind of figure out. I, I like to say you, you figure out your groove as you um, explore and discover the caregiving journey. I would quickly add, Jen, uh, to all your wonderful points that that role reversal brings a, a, a real interesting dynamic too. I know when I was caring for my father, it was the last thing he wanted. It wasn't that he didn't accept me. He didn't want me to be his caregiver. He wanted me to be his daughter. And there were so many things to take care of that I had to become his caregiver. And that was a real tough thing for him. And I, I acknowledged it and I knew it, um, but I couldn't always make it different, obviously. So that's a real consideration with your loved ones. Um, they certainly don't wanna be in that situation when it's a family member. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Um, I also had the, the challenge with the role reversal too. I, I realized I didn't expand on it a little bit, um, uh, a little bit ago. But the role reversal, my grandma was like the ultimate matriarch in the family. Yeah, yeah. Just she made yeah. all the decisions. She was the one that was always calling for everybody to come to family dinner. Like she was the glue. And so right. when she was not able to, you know, speak as much and get everybody together, I knew that she like somebody had to, you know, step up to that plate or, so I would try to do that. It's not the same. I just don't, <laughs> I don't have the sassiness of my grandma, mm -hmm. but the role reversal of then, okay, if she used to make all the decisions, who's going to make all these decisions now? And I have to start making decisions for her. How is she going to take it? You know, I'm making these decisions for your well-being, grandma. And it was, as I say, it was, it was a process. And by learning how to communicate to, with one another, with a bit of compassion, we were we were able to get through it. But it's it's not easy, you know. You you have the person you're looking up to, and that person is no longer there anymore. How do you deal with that? You know, how do you deal with that type of um, anticipatory grief? Like, like this 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 relationship may not be there. The roles are being reversed. How how do I process this? What are these feelings? And with each transition comes like a whole new wave of emotions. Very true. Um, I'd like to add to, to this part of the conversation that uh, there is a point where every phone call I would get from my mother, she was in assisted living, but I always saw her finances, her medical, her everything. And it just I just became like this clearinghouse for her. And I finally, I said, I really miss being her son. And it's been too long I've been her son. So I actually went down there and said, mom, I'm tired of this. I need to be your son. I need to be your son for a day. And I need to be your son at least once a week. So every phone call just isn't about how I'm caring for you or what we're taking care of or the problems that you have. I want to have that mother-son relationship again because it's not going to be here forever. Mm. And it was very, she, because of who she was and being bipolar, it took her a little bit to work into that and i would have to remind her after i asked for that i was like this call is about being your son it is nothing about anything else and i would have to make that space in order for that so i had as a caregiver 
to ask for that space to be there. And the reminder, because I missed that, because I knew as, as she's not with us anymore, I miss her now. And I'm glad I was able to have those few moments at the end where I could ask for those things. Um, part of caregiving is the need to be respected and understood. Sometimes that's really, really missed. Um, to achieve this, being heard is essential in supporting caregiver needs. Please discuss as a caregiver, caregiver what it means to be fully heard by family, patients, and anybody that's trying to be supportive. How does this make caregiving less stressful when you are heard? I can speak to that sort of on a, on a personal note um, in that I found, especially with family, I had to make it very clear, A, why I was you know, delegating myself as the primary caregiver and what my goals were and what I was trying to accomplish and letting those around me know that I did need their support. I, I didn't expect them to do some of the things I was doing, but I needed their support and them to understand that I was doing the best at the time that I could. Um, because, you know, let's face it with families, I mean, there can be criticism, there can be well, don't you think you should do this? Don't you think you should do that? And it, it's not you don't want uh, input. I certainly wanted that. But it was important for me to let someone know where I was coming from. Uh, it was really critical. I remember that so well. And it made a difference. It really made a difference because no one was trying to give me a hard time, but they just wanted to understand. So we had to come to a common ground. And it, it was a, a very important thing to do. Um, and I think that's true for caregivers. They're, you know, they don't, they don't sign up knowing precisely how this is going to go. And so it's, it's difficult to, to um, navigate the waters, so to speak. And it's important to let others know that, yeah, you know, this isn't easy. And, but I'm doing the best that I think I can. I was fortunate, in addition to my brother, I was fortunate enough to have a big family that lived um, within say like one to five mile radius of grandma's house. You know, I had a lot of aunties and uncles and uh, eight other cousins. So I'd like to, you know, when we talked about caregiving can take a village that really helped in my caregiving role world and um, being heard and being respected as a caregiver, um, I think it really started to take place when I embraced the caregiver identity. I, I mentioned earlier that it took me, you know, till maybe year five, you know, year five till I did, I realized I was a caregiver and things weren't things weren't too intense with grandma. It was a slow progression of her physicality. You know, the diabetes made um, it was just slow over time. Her di diabetes made her ankle swollen. She couldn't walk as well. So we needed a walker and then she became incontinent. Then she needed a wheelchair. So had to do a lot of transferring toileting. So it was a, just like a lot of little things that added up over time. So by year five, it was almost like a full plate. And then I realized I was a caregiver. And then when that happened, I decided to really take on caregiving, not only as a job, but, but as like, this project management role, like this, this is a job. I, there's so many things I need to do. So I should treat it in my, you know, in my family role, like a professional job, like a career. Okay, who's on my team? Who do I need to check in with? How, who do I need to communicate with? And so what, what really helped my caregiving was in, <laughs> in some ways it was, I was an over communicator. I constantly gave project updates or uh, health <laughs> updates to everybody. And at that time, um, with you know, with the in, you know, with the cell phone technology, I got everybody on a group text and just um, had group family chat to update people and over communicated everything, uh, talked about my brother and my schedule on when we we needed another person to cover our shift. Just like, hey, can, you know, can somebody take this weekend shift? I can't do it, but I would over communicate ahead of time to let them know if they're available, then they can pitch in. 
I had a shared Google calendar. I, I had it extremely organized so people can easily volunteer if they wanted to. And for those who weren't engaged, let's just say, um, you know, ideal world, everybody wants to participate, but real caregiving world, not everybody wants to take on caregiving tasks. <laughs> so some people dropped out of that group text. That's okay. <laughs> Maybe they didn't want that much information and it's okay because I respect their capacity and perhaps they just couldn't receive, um, they didn't want to be involved with all this project, uh, all these updates, but at least they knew that I was doing something. I think part of caregiving, what caregiving taught me was being a patient advocate for my grandma. But then I also decided I need to be an advocate of myself. I need to be able to advocate when I'm, you know, for my self care, for my well being, when I'm maxed out, can somebody help? And by letting people know just consistently what's going on, they're in the loop. And it's kind of like keeping the conversation open for them to um, engage with me and say, hey, you know what? Can I, you know, seems like you're doing a lot. Can I, can I help out? Hey, you mentioned you wanted to go on vacation at some point. Where are you going? How many days is that? Okay, maybe I can do this or that for you. So I took it on as a job to express what's going on. And I included everybody via communication and I, I kept the channels open. And it really helped when I felt like I was stressed out or burned out and then other people can step up. And I didn't need to give them a backlog of the history of what's going on because I've been communicating. They don't need to say, so what do I need? You know, what's been happening with grandma? Oh no, you know what's going on. <laughs> Present day, this is all you need to know and this is what you need to take on. Thank you. And I'm going to check out. <laughs> It was um it was very beautiful. I, again, I want to just I always give a shout out to my family because you know I couldn't have done it alone, and I was really uh, happy that uh, some folks pitched in more than others, and that um, we were able to caregive Grandma all the way till the end. I think you just gave us so many wonderful suggestions for <laughs> what we can suggest to caregivers. Um, ways that they can take charge, can organize. And of course, every family is different, as you said, but I really appreciated you sharing how you handled it because those can be very practical suggestions for families. Thank you. Yes, very good. And you know, that family piece, I didn't have a place where I had family. A lot of my family's not even close to my mom, uh, emotionally or physically. And so Thank God I had a younger sister and there's two things I asked of her. I said, I just need a container when I just need to just dump and barf. I just need somebody to listen to me, not fix or try and do anything of this or judge me. But if I need to do this, I just need a place where I can just go off for five, seven minutes. And she was that person. And I just oh. love her dearly for, for having that one person I know that was always there and that consistency to do that. And the other piece was, is the small task things. And I said, the one thing you can do, and you can do it by mail order or by Amazon or whatever, is you got to buy mom bras and underwear. That is not the <laughs> son's job at all. That is, I'm not going in that territory. That is your territory. And that's the one thing you can do because she seemed to always ask for them. So it was kind of funny. So those were two helpful things that I felt helped me in communicating. Somebody who would really listen to me and somebody who listened to just do one task. And she didn't have to leave the comfort of her own home. She just did it all through, I think, I think she did Amazon. So that worked out really well. Um, Craig, I wanted to just hop on to that one thing. I just, you reminded me of the one, my one cousin who took on um, nail clipping, um, clipping my grandma's nails. That was one thing I couldn't do. And when she asked how she could help, I said, can you do that one thing when you visit? And she did it. That's the power of asking and letting people know this one thing. It, it made a difference because that, that one thing can, you know, I don't know, that the one thing can add to an additional layer of stress and another thing to do. But if somebody can make the Amazon orders, right, that one person can um, clip the nails, that's one task that a caregiver does not need to do. And it's, it's powerful when people when people ask if they can help, I think it's amazing if you're able to pull up a ready to go list. <laughs> yeah. 
if he was like, let me know if I can help you. I said, perfect. I have five things that I have saved on my phone. Um, which five would you like to do right now? <laughs> you know, and how much time do you have? Like, it's, it's got to be measurable. You know, you want to help. Do you have 15 minutes, one hour, half a day or a whole day? Which one would you like to choose? Then again, it opens the conversation for them saying, oh, okay, this is, this is happening. Okay, let's sign up. So I think to be, as, to be a caregiver, and when people ask for help, be very specific. You would be surprised by how people respond. For the volunteer department, and I see many volunteers that are in this um, uh, forum that these are the things that you can ask of a caregiver, these simple things, probably maybe not ordering on Amazon unless you're there with their credit card on their computer, but um, the simple things, just remember to ask the simple things. You might be there just for socialization with the patient, but coming in, can I do something? You make that phone call before you show up. Is there something I could bring you? Or even when you're leaving, is there something you need next week that I can do? If not, think about it. And when I call, let me know what that might be. I think that's really, really important. Um, and we're going to continue down this communication vein here. And uh, communication at times being a caregiver can be so difficult, uh, especially when someone, um, there's a lot of tension. It could be with the patient, it could be with other family members because they're in disagreements with what's going on or other things in the life. Um, when these uh, tensions are high, how does one in the middle of the tension find within, them, uh, find within themselves a positive way, a way of bringing themselves to be able to be positive and really express themselves about the tensions that are there to, to diffuse it so things aren't as stressful. What are some of the things that you guys might uh, suggest? Well, I think as um, Jen said about having a list ready for things that you need, it's also jotting down things that you really want to share. Um, with those around you and being prepared um, because tensions can get high. It's just everybody's going through an emotional time. And also, as odd as this may sound, I think it is so important to say, keep the conversation, you know, keep the pitch low and even. As odd as that might sound, I remember when we used to have big emergencies when I worked as a nurse. And one of the techniques I learned was to lower my voice, mm -hmm. to give directions, to tell people what to do, because everyone's adrenaline was just so high. And while caregiving isn't that same setting, it but it's a, it does work to be gentle, to be quiet, to be very clear in what you want to say. Um, and that brings the tension level down. I really believe that. And I do know, I, I mean, I saw it in my own family. I mean, with so many family members passing away, you know, it, it becomes so emotional. And so if you know what you want to say, if you ha are prepared, if you can do it in a gentle, quiet way, it's amazing how much the others appreciate that and, and can respond um, in a positive way. It's just, it's just a thought. I love that thought, Judy, just setting the tone. You know, like you say, emotions can run really high during caregiving and maybe you can model the tone um, and model the behavior of how you want to communicate and how you, you want to receive communication that can allow the conversation to flow a bit easier. Um, for communication, I've, I've found that it's important to um, ask for capacity. That's one thing that's worked really well for me. Um, and also it's, um, I've mentioned uh, doing support groups before too. Um, and it's also important to ask for cap capacity with our care partners and with our family members. And in terms of asking for capacity, it's really talking about emotional capacity. Hey, do you, do you, do you have capacity to talk about this thing right now? Then we're able to really check in with the other person to see if they're emotionally available. Do you have capacity to talk about, you know, do you have the capacity to talk about, um, say, the advanced healthcare directive? 
that could be a big conversation somebody may not be ready for, but you throw it out there and say, well, if, if the person responds, I'm no, I'm not. What is that? Well, it's very important. Can we carve out a time where we can talk about it? And then they ask for permission to have the conversation. Kind of like Judy, you know, when you say check in in the tone, right? Do you have capacity? It allows us to check in on our personal individual self. Like, do, do I have capacity to talk right now? And the other person can also check in to see if they can receive information and offer information. So I think doing the capacity check um, is, I think it's, it's a good technique. Um, also asking for, for consent to give advice or suggestions that really helps when it, there's a really stressful environment. Um, asking, hey, can, you know, just practicing um, that type of communication and also asking your family and friends and whoever you're talking, you know, whoever is on your care team to talk to you like that. Because it is, again, checking in your capacity. Hey, can I give you some advice? How many times have we had gotten unsolicited caregiving advice from people? They don't know our situation. <laughs> it was like, wait, no, I'm, I'm not ready for advice today. I'm kind of maxed out, but you know what? I would love to hear your advice tomorrow. Connect with me tomorrow about advice. Or it could be, hey, can I, can I ask you a question? Oh, okay, well, let me see. Then we're able to really check in. Again, check in on our well-being. If not emotional, we can also check in on our mental well-being or maybe physical. No, you know, I'm absolutely physically exhausted. I just had a 12-hour caregiving shift. I cannot take any questions. I cannot read any messages. I simply can't. But you, you know, but you're connecting with me. So let's schedule a time to talk about what that question is or what, you know, I want to hear, I want to hear your advice when I can fully absorb everything because that's important. And that continues to keep the um, communication lines open, I think. That's great advice, Jen. You know, instead of shutting somebody down and yeah. they feel pushed away, mm -hmm. it leaves an open channel and I don't know what the percentage is that they got back to you the next day with that advice is, but it, it just didn't completely shut them down and, and explaining the way I'm just burnt out. I don't have the capacity to take anything else on because of what I'm doing. And many times advice is not really taking in fully the nature of the situation because each caregiving situation is different and each day can be different too. And uh, people may not understand the dynamics between caregiver and patient or other family, why this advice comes flying in unsolicited. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good suggestion too. Um, we all love Frank Ostasteski and he always he has the advice in his five precepts is, uh, uh, is taking a rest in the middle of things. As a caregiver, I think that's really, really important to find time to take a rest in the middle of things. And this isn't going out for a two-hour walk and leaving your patient alone. That's what volunteers are for, or finding somebody that could sit with that patient. But um, for both, both you, Judy, and Jen, how does this resonate with you? How did you find time to take rest in the middle of things? just to recenter yourself, regroup, and that way you could be fully present for what you needed to do. It's a great, great question. Mm -hmm. Right off the top, I wish I had your breathing meditation technique. That would have been lovely <laughs> when I was um, next to grandma's bedside during hospice care. That I felt really energizing. I felt like that was something you can do just right there. And it only took a couple minutes. Um, and those breathing techniques, you know, just centering, um, being able to take a break in the midst of things. Um, that I mean, this that's is right off top of my head. Um, personally, I think um, in in taking a rest in the middle of things, I, I I hear, you know, to reset. I think of it as a form of obvious form of self care for the caregiver, and and when it comes to self-care, I like to think of it as like a holistic approach. Um, when you're trying to take a time for yourself real quick, aside from caregiving, um, holistically, meaning not only checking in on yourself, your well-being, um, emotionally, it could be checking with yourself mentally, uh, physically, uh, and spiritually. I think in caregiving, there could be moments when we can take time to take care of ourselves, but when we're, we can be specific of what these little tasks could be for, 
then that can really fill our buckets while we're caregiving. Maybe it's been a while since I've connected my, with myself spiritually. How can I carve that in during today, um, during my caregiving shift today? You know, haven't connected with myself physically. How could I do that? You know, phys physicality, just exercise was a really big, big thing for me. So I built an at-home gym right outside of grandma's room. And so I was able to do both, <laughs> but I knew that was my, the thing that I needed to do just to have the physical release from the stress. And I built something that I can do that took care of my well-being at that time. And so I think in carving out what can caregivers do, I would say, think about what fills your bucket. What's part, what's your whole being? Is it a combination of all of those things, you know, emotional, mental, physical, uh, psychological and spiritual is that what you need for that day and find something that can fill that um, for that rest period you want to create for yourself because then that can continue to feed your well-being and allow you to continue caring for your loved one i can remember when hospice workers would come and see my different family members over the years I would take that opportunity and say, is it okay? I just want to step outside. I want, I needed to get out of the environment, not go far mm -hmm. and certainly be available if they needed me, but just spend a little bit of time out of the house. It was amazing how taking in some deep fresh air mm -hmm. and seeing the sunshine or not, but just being away, even a very brief period of time how that really helped, you know, refresh me. Mm -hmm. And then I was ready to go back and I was ready to, to take it on again. But I think it's so easy to get so mired in what is going on, which is understandable, that that little break, it, it, we underrate it, how important that it can be. And it was amazing. I, I would even walk, you know, like walk around the block, but just something to take that full break, knowing that the, that person was taken care of and someone was with them and it was an immense help. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Do something that is not caregiving. If the hospice team is available to you and then you have a little bit of time, um, just step away and do something that's not caregiving at all. <laughs> I know sometimes you feel like checking off your to-do list may feel like it's <laughs> not caring, but sometimes doing that is still um, taking care of uh, caregiving responsibility. So um, breathing in fresh air, I love that. Um, I did a lot of gardening, we had a yard, so it, it felt good to touch dirt, just something something opposite from something very clinical and sterile. I just wanted <laughs> to touch dirt. You know, cups of tea, because you can get it ready and you could spend three minutes hugging a cup of tea or a coffee mm -hmm. and just staring out a window at a bird, a tree, the traffic, whatever it might be, it is a good break. <laughs> I know for me, um, that breathing technique would work well with my mom because she'd get really ramped up and wouldn't stop. And I didn't want to stop her. She needed to do whatever she needed to do, but I had to stay centered and grounded in myself. So I would say, five breaths slowly through my nose and I could just act like I'm looking, but just go blank. And it would restore me, it would help me an awful lot. Um, we are actually at 449, so we actually need to get to some questions. This went very quickly. And so um, let's see, Elijah, were you gonna post some or should I just go to the chat? I just put them all in the top of the chat for you, Craig, and time okay. has definitely flown by. Yes, it has. Um, question for Jen. How do you switch between your roles, identity of caregiver and granddaughter? Um, great question. Um, I came up with activities that I could do with my grandma. Um, so it, it didn't have to do with changing a diaper or, uh, transferring her or giving her her insulin shots or cooking or cleaning. I didn't, that, that's all the caregiving things, right? But I wanted to create new memories with my grandma, especially during hospice when she was bedridden. It was a little bit, it was a little challenging and to, re, to create that bonding experience between my grandma and I. Um, one, there was during Christmas, we, uh, you know, we, 
I wanted to, I got a big tree, but I, I wanted her help in putting the little ornament hooks and the little ornament balls. And then we could do that together by her bedside. And we were able to have that experience and, you know, maybe sing some Christmas tunes and I can play some music. And then that was something that felt like we can have a connection with. But then she got really mad because then just, it was hard for her to, you know, hook the ornaments. So I said, okay, well, that was a good activity, but now I need to come with something that's a easier activity. Again, I mentioned it's by trial and error. But that felt good because we got to experience a holiday. And one other thing that I did was with grandma, she was a avid, she was a huge Mahjong fan for all of those. So this is a gambling um, <laughs> game uh, for Chinese folks. Uh, she was a big gambler. And I mentioned I also like um, to exercise. So when grandma was um, in hospice, uh, she did not want to exercise. So I decided that maybe we can make up a fun activity. I said, grandma, we're going to have to get you in shape for gambling, for playing, uh, for playing Mahjong, but you're going to be, need to be able to move your arms around like this and shuffle. So let's do some arm exercises together. Um, so we, so she started, she, I'm like, you know, the other grandmas are waiting for you. So, you know, when you're ready, let's, you know, do it every, every day, if you want to, to move your arms around. And as soon as I talked about her favorite activity, she started exercising every single day. And I got to connect with her because I saw so much joy in her talking about all the grandmas that she's gonna see when she can play that activity again. And we were exercising together and we created a new activity. So um, that was one way uh, that I was able to switch from caregiving tasks to let's do some new activities and this new paradigm and this new space. What's, what can be fun for both of us and to create new memories. Uh, next question, uh, this will be to both of you, it's not directed to anybody. When is it our family member, when it is our family member or friend, the stress and fear and anger is sometimes or perhaps often in a way of a calming process, processing the moment. How do you get from panic to calm in the presence, in the presence of an intense encounter? Well, I know for myself, going back to what I, I talked about, but I certainly start by taking a couple of very deep breaths and just letting things sit for a minute or two. Um, and then that technique of, you know, a calm, gentle voice and allowing the other person, you know, to speak, to, to say what it is that they're trying to express. Um, but being non-confrontational, just listening and hearing um, what the other person says, because it may not, it could be coming from anywhere and certainly emotions because of, of just what's going on. And I certainly saw some of that go on in my own family from time to time, depending on what the situation was. And we would always try to end it by saying, it's okay. It's okay to have those feelings. It's okay to have those, to express those things. Um, but let's not forget we're family. Let's not forget that we're all trying to do something for this person. Um, I always did become the main caregiver. And as I say, I think that was something that was delegated to me just because of what I did for a living. But that was okay, as long as others understood that we, we had to support one another. And they were good. I mean, they really were good. It, it, there was such a difference between caring for my mother when she went through her final illness and caring for my father. That was because of their personalities. Um, everybody was all in with my mother. My dad was a wonderful person, but he was just a little more cantankerous. So I seemed to be able to handle him a little better. But that part was fine. I knew that. I, I understood that. And I got a lot of support from family saying, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do it. So that's all I needed to hear. And I think that's, you know, just acknowledge what's happening, acknowledge what's what's being said, what's being done. And it's it's amazingly supportive um, to be that open and honest, I think. I agree with that, Judy, the power of listening, you know, with an open heart, I think, um, validating people's feelings when they're really stressed out and you know frustrated and they're really angry it um, creates a connection point you know if family if that family or let's see family members or friends are really just riled up and ask 
ask them how they're feeling and then validate their feelings and say, I understand that feeling. You know, I, I know what that feels like. You know, I'm with you. I share that feeling with you. And that right. could potentially be common because then now you're on the same page. It could be that people are here. here. We're all in different places, but by, by the power of listening with an open heart, then we can kind of come to an understanding and a common ground. <laughs> And then, then potentially have a deeper conversation at that point. Right. Uh, we just have five minutes left, but I think this is a really good question. And uh, I'll read it. I think resentment is another emotion that shows up sometimes, both for caregiver and recipient. Did this happen to either of you? How did you deal with it? Oh, it happened to me because of just what I was talking about, my relationship with my father, for whatever reason that I could really handle who he was far better than my oldest sister. And there was a lot of resentment. I mean, I felt it, I knew it was there and had to address, had to address it because it's like, I'm not in this because he likes me better. I'm in this because I think I can, I can handle this better. Uh, and it's okay, it's okay um, with me. But you see that resentment thing of, you know, well, do you think you're, you know, you can do this better than the rest of us? And it was like, no, mm -hmm. I think I can handle his personality a little better than, than perhaps some others can. But oh yeah, no, that really did happen. That was a tough one, a very tough one. And I so understand, but again, it's, addressing the elephant in the room and saying, you know, I, I hear you. I understand where you're coming from. My, this is my intention. My intention is to care for dad and do the best that I can doing that. And um, it helped. It helped a lot. Just acknowledging those feelings that, no, I, I don't think I have any magic bullet here. It's just how this thing has played out mm -hmm. uh, when I hear you say Judy intention that just absolutely hits a just a note with me because I feel like with resentment yes I experienced resentment a lot and I was a young caregiver that I, I can go into all the things I was resentful for but I want to piggyback on your your word for intention because I think in the midst of all the all the emotions especially resentment, being able to, as a caregiver, being able to go back to your reason, your intention for caregiving. And that is a grounding piece. That could be a grounding piece because you can, once you tap into the intention, you can explore for yourself, what is the value of what you're doing? You know, what, what is the, what is, what is the caregiving based on? Is it based on family values? Is it based on ethics? What other values are you making this choice of caregiving? How is that? How are these values uh, determining your, your every day that you show up to be a caregiver? What is your intention? Maybe that could be like the North Star, the compass, right? When things are really chaotic, it could be, let's go back, let's go back, find my compass. What is my intention? Okay, the reason why I'm doing this is because I value X, Y, and Z. So being able to remind ourselves of what that intention is could be potentially. Uh, be a good way of dealing with um, a lot of difficult and complex emotions. Um, and I can, ex I mean, I know we've got one minute left, but I can say I definitely dealt with resentment, but I realized as a young caregiver that this was um, going to give me a lot of um, wisdom for my later years. <laughs> I was re resentful yeah. because, you know, I, I wanted to go date, I wanted to pursue a career, but my value was family value. I know that the, my intention was to continue to take care of my family. And when I was done with caregiving, I can go get another job. I can go date and I can go travel. So I allowed my intention to help um, ease my resentment and allowed me to continue doing it for 10 years. I always told my family, when it's over, it's gonna be over. Mm -hmm. And so I can only do the best I can do right now because there's no do-overs. You know, when someone is in the process of dying, we know we can't go back and fix it. So you do the very best that you can. And that seemed to be something that really helped put things in perspective. What wonderful words to close on, Judy. Uh, Thank you. That was very touching. I appreciate that. Um, 
it's five o'clock. We said this would last an hour. And so we are going to conclude this discussion. I want to thank everybody who participated, uh, being a caregiver, a volunteer, or a staff member. Um, I hope that you uh, taken away from this some tidbits that can help you and help those who are caregiving, because that was the whole idea of this. And I felt the discussion went very well. Thank you, Judy. And thank you, Jen. Your insights and wisdoms are really wonderful. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye, thank everybody. You for all your stories. Yeah. Bye-bye.